Life is sometimes like that song. I'm going to get all music theory on you here. The whole song was in a minor key to the very last note. And it suddenly went happy at the end. Your life and my life is going to be like that at times. A minor key, pain and sadness, and then the moment you die, it goes major key on you. Right? Amen? You hold in there. The angels in heaven, they have your name. They know your name. Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit on this place. As we read and study your word, as we eat and drink, all of us together, as we share with the little ones what it means and remember ourselves, what you gave up to be a part of our lives. Come Holy Spirit, come. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn to the third chapter of Exodus. Uh, there are pew Bibles ahead of some of you. It is on the wall, stand in honor of God's word and let's read it together from Exodus chapter three, verses one, through 15. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within, from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to the bush, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I am concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land. A land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am that I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I know some of you will sometimes feel and suspect that God has no idea what you're going through. Because we're talking feelings here, right? It feels like God doesn't know what you're going through, right? Your feelings are not always accurate. Sometimes, sometimes you might feel like you're ugly when you're not ugly and some some of you might think you're better looking than you are and some oftentimes we think we're brighter than we are you know in Kentucky 70 something percent of Kentucky drivers think they're above average I mean the math just really doesn't work your feelings are not an accurate depiction of what the reality is but I understand there are times 
down in that dark, low place where you think God doesn't know and God doesn't care. And in this passage, once again, we see someone who thinks that God isn't going to do anything about the slavery of his chosen people. And they couldn't be any further wrong. I have seen the suffering of my people. I have heard their prayers. That ought to encourage some of us who think that our prayers don't go any higher than the ceiling. You know, I know people all over the state of Kentucky, and you don't know them, but I know them. The only connection you might have to them is through my Facebook page. But since 1980, when I went into the ministry in every church I've pastored, I have heard somebody say, I feel like my prayers don't get any higher than the ceiling. Now, you've never met them, and God doesn't teach that in his word. So I just want to ask you from a spiritual perspective, if you don't know those other people, but you're using exactly the words they're using, and God didn't teach you to think that way, where is that little voice coming from that tells you your prayers don't matter? I'll give you a hint. You're quoting each other. You just don't know it because it's happened over the course of 37 years. Israel thought there was no hope. God had made big promises. They'd been in slavery for a long, long time. Oh, and then God has this great plan. I've come down to rescue them. I giggle as I read that this morning because Moses would say, well, about time, Lord. Thank you for coming down and doing something. I can't wait to see what you're going to do when you rescue these people. They've been hurting for a long time. They've been praying for a Savior for a long, long time. They need somebody to stand up to Pharaoh and tell them what's for. Go God, go God, go God. He doesn't have a clue what's getting ready to happen. I am sending you to speak to Pharaoh. Buh, 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 buh. I was teasing with someone this morning, asking them to be a, a greeter sometime. And I said, you know, you'd be amazed. We call people up and ask them to be a greeter. Oh, I couldn't do something like that. You can't smile and shake people's hands. You can't smile and say hello. You know, sometimes we think we just, we just can't. We're not up to the task. Now, very few of us are going to sing a solo like Robin just did. And if you're on the internet, you missed it, but it was awesome. And, and all of us can't teach like certain people. And, and Mitch Castle has the biggest heart in the world. He's collected money for Texas. If you're on Facebook, anywhere connected to him, he's got a list of things you can bring to Louisa. He's going to get it to Texas somehow. That is a spiritual gift. It's a, it, you know, we all have different gifts. We need each other. Because we don't have the same gifts. Everybody doesn't need to be a pastor, but you need at least one. And everybody doesn't have to be a Sunday school teacher. Everybody doesn't have to be a great cook. But church works a lot better when you go down there to eat and somebody who knew what they were doing puts good food in front of you. You're important to the kingdom of God. Those of you with a driver's license, say amen, Heather. You're important to the kingdom of God. There you go. And the person who's cooking in the kitchen can't drive the bus and vice versa. You really wouldn't want the person driving the bus to be cooking. Yeah. Turn left, okay. Where, your ministry is important. God said he's going to do something. Moses said, all right, let's see it. Here it is, Moses. I'm sending you to Pharaoh. Now, there's a little problem with Moses. If you've been going to church all of your life, you probably know that Moses has this flaw. He looks just like Charlton Heston. He's big and tall. He's a strong jaw, but he has a speech impediment. If you don't understand that joke, it's a 1950s movie, okay, forget it. He has this speech impediment. He doesn't talk plain. Do you have anybody in your family that doesn't talk plain? My little brother couldn't say Fs when he was a little boy. One, two, three, tour. One, two, three, tour. I mean, we just persecuted him. Now he's got a PhD, smartest fellow in the family, and you know, he reminds us we made fun of that way he talked. Moses had a speech impediment. And God went out of his way to call someone whose mouth doesn't work all that well to be the spokesman and the mouthpiece of God himself on behalf of God's chosen people. Now, that ought to encourage you just a little bit. 
I was preaching a sermon like this back in Bowling Green, right out of seminary. And I said, if, I was talking about the disciples, and I said, if God can use that motley crew, God can use you too. A lady came up to me after the church service. She says, I'm offended at all of your rock music references in your sermon. She was, she was making a, she was setting me up for a joke, but she looked like she was mad and I didn't have a clue. I'm talking about the disciples and she's saying I'm preaching on rock music. I said, Joyce, I didn't say anything about rock bands. You sure did. You said that the disciples were a motley crew. Now that's a rock band right there, Brother Dan. And you said if God can use that motley crew, then God can use you too. That's another rock band, Brother Dan. Then she started giggling real big and I said, you know, I'm glad you're listening, but you took that in a place I really did not expect it to go. God can do so much with your little bit when the little bit is what he's called you to do. So much with your little bit. Moses was shepherding at Horeb. The bush was ablaze. Does everybody get a burning bush? No. From time to time since I've been here, you've said, now when you talk about God talking to you, exactly what do you mean? Are you nuts or not? How does God talk to you and why doesn't he talk to me? Well, he speaks to people in different ways. If you really want to bless a pastor, ask him or her to tell you about their call to preach. Sometimes it's fun to get some pastor that I don't know in a conversation over coffee and say, tell me about your call to preach. Gives you a funny look. Nobody ever asked me about that. Well, do you have a, you have a story about that? Oh, yeah. And he starts telling that story. Next thing you know, that preacher starts lifting off the seat where, you know, just to remember what God did and what he said and all the circumstances that led to where he, where he, he or she is at this point in time in ministry. You want to bless a pastor and get a blessing yourself. Ask a pastor to tell you how God called them to preach. Some of them are embarrassed to tell you. A lot of them will say, you're going to think I'm crazy if I tell you that story. A lot of us think you'll never believe it. I've told you a time or two. I'm not going to do it today. But on this particular day, Moses gets called into the ministry with a bush that is on fire and it's not being consumed. Have you ever seen one of those? Me neither. God did something miraculous when he called me to preach, but it wasn't a burning bush. God called John Wesley to preach. It wasn't a burning bush. It was a burning heart. He didn't know how to explain it. He called it his heartwarming experience. God said, take off your shoes. Place your standing as holy ground. We come into the worship service and we've got a double latte and a muffin. We sit down and ready to worship. Got the thing here. And you know, my, my, my oldest daughter's church is really bad about that particular thing because it's a Lowe's theater. They got the best screen in the world. The PA is out of this world. It doesn't even exist except on Sunday morning. But the deal was that the Lowe's or whatever it was would let this church meet there on Sunday morning if they could sell refreshments. So people come in to Jessica's church, they got their goobers, you know, and their big gulpy, you know, and it's the craziest thing in the world. And, and, and they sing songs I don't know, I don't like them, I don't know them, you know. The, ser the preaching is good, I mean the Bible's the Bible, but the, the things they do beforehand, you know, gulp, you know, the hands go up, you know, and they put it in the other hand, and gulp, and the other hand goes up, you know, it's, 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 it's foreign to me. And boy is it powerful. Boy is it powerful. And I was sitting there last time I was in worship thinking, you know, I don't like this. I wouldn't go to church if I lived in Washington, D.C. And that little voice, the one that got me into trouble and called me to preach and rescued me from my juvenile delinquency, he whispered, oh yeah, well they wouldn't like your preaching either. <laughs> they wouldn't. I can't do what that guy's doing. I don't have a theater. I don't know how to make that much popcorn. I don't like people worshiping and gulping at the same time. I'm the only goober in this worship service. You know what I'm saying? But it works. They have six locations. They're always getting ready to build a new one, and he's preaching the word. Oh, man, it works. Have you ever taken off your shoes in worship? I don't know that I do, except when I get ready for the baptistry, you know. 
But God said to Moses, you take off your shoes. This is holy ground. You are my spokesman. But, 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 you think he had a speech impediment before. Now he's really got one. But, 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 but. Sounds like trying to start a two-stroke lawnmower. It hadn't been started for a but, 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 but. Because God's plan needed Moses. God's plan needs you. How can that be? I don't know. I'm not God. God's plan needs you. He can't drive the bus. He can't cook all the fried chicken. And I don't think he cooks as well as Donnie Brown does. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's got their strengths. He can create the world in six days and rest on the seventh. But nobody touches Don Brown. And his cooking. Hilda, you're a lucky woman. <laughs> God needs you to do what he wants to do in the lives of others. Tell me what your name is. That was really, really important in the olden days. If you knew a God's name, you supposedly had power over them. He said, I don't even know your name. And God's answer is just kind of bizarre in English. But what it means is, I am the only God that is. That's what I am means. I am that I am. That's what it means in Hebrew. I am the only God that exists. The one true God. Tell them the one God that is. The only one that is sent you. You wouldn't think that plan would work. But it did. Then they get backed up against the Red Sea and they're pretty sure God led them out into the desert just to let them drown instead of dying of hunger and thirst. He's going to drown, but rescued them again. Over and over and over again. The Old Testament is the story of God doing the impossible for people who don't really necessarily measure up. But he made them a promise. I'm with you. I know what you are. I love you. I'm going to help you. You're going to be in heaven someday. Because you're my child. Well, let me just kind of go quickly here because I kind of slowed down back in there. There's a lot of different ways of hearing from God. You can hear from God in the scripture. Oh, let me tell you what happened a few, a few months ago now. I, me and the Lord were having a, I was complaining and he was listening patiently. I was, in the sec, I was in the book of Chronicles and I didn't like it. I had read the kings and the judges and all that story was back there and that and it was all well thought out and I'd already read it and I get into Chronicles and it's repeating it and, and I just decided I don't want to read any more Chronicles now, Lord. Why did you put Chronicles right after kings and judges? Because it was good when I heard it the first time but this is that little Cliff Notes version. And I just got through hearing these stories and it was much better in, in Judges and Kings and here I am. And here's my problem, Lord. You said all scripture is inspired, but I really don't want to read any more in Chronicles. May I, just, may I just quit reading Chronicles and go somewhere else? Well, that didn't sound right. So I just had this little conversation with God where I said, Lord, I'm not getting anything out of this Chronicles at all. But just for spite... I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going, to read every, I'm going to read a chapter at least every day till I get through with this old Chronicles. Then I'll go read something good. Guess what came after Chronicles? <laughs> Job. All right, so uh, I'm in Job now. So I begrudgingly told God I'm going to submit to his word and I'm going to finish up this old stinky Chronicles because I'd rather be somewhere else. I turned the page and the first words on the page were, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Then I will hear from heaven. We'll, we'll heal their land. I forgot that was in Chronicles. That's, that's good stuff right there. That's some of the high points of the Old Testament. I almost bailed on my Bible one page before some of the best stuff in the Old Testament. And I could hear, I, I could sense someone laughing at me. Told you it's all good. I mean, he wasn't a burning bush making fun of me, but I got the message. You're the boss. I'm the reader. You're the writer. I got it. I got it. I got it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is inspired of God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. God will speak to you through your Bible. 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says, No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So my point is this. You can hear from God in the Bible, and I'm sure you have. You read something you've read several times before, but on this particular day, it nails you between the eyeballs and you know that's like, I've heard you say, it's like that was written for me today. That's what, that's what it's like when the Holy Ghost is in something like the Bible. But you can also hear the, from God through people. Over and over again through my ministry, people have met me at the front door, kind of confused, a little annoyed, saying, how'd you know? And I've learned when people come up to me right after I preach saying, how do you know? I slow them down. I don't know nothing. And my mama can prove it. I know nothing about nothing. If God spoke to you in the last 25 minutes, it was him, not me. Don't reveal anything you think I've heard down at the restaurant because I've heard nothing about I do not know what we're talking about. Do you want me to know? Then tell me. But what you just experienced was not me, it was God. It's amazing how that happens. But you know, occasionally you do it to each other. You'll say something, words of encouragement, you'll get a, you'll get a, a wild hair and you'll call somebody up and they'll say, oh, I'm so glad you called. I'm having such a bad day, I'm so lonely. And I, I was just asking God, you know, send me a friend and you called, thank you so much. You realize, oh my gosh, I'm an answer to a Prayer? Does God do that? Does God do that? Yes, he does that. He does that. He uses you to be a blessing to others. How about prayer? God will speak to us in prayer. He will beat you up in prayer. He does me occasionally, occasionally, occasionally. He will, he will lift me up sometimes, and sometimes he will point me at the mistakes in my life and says, fix this. Wisdom is found on your knees. Sometimes God speaks by the doors he opens and the doors he closes. Do I go this way? Do I go that way? In one way, it's just the way just kind of opens up. Sometimes miraculously, the bank gives you the loan. You, they said they weren't going to give you for this particular thing. And the thing you were kind of leaning toward, there's just no way. You can even get an appointment with the guy and you can't get the money. And this door opens and that door doesn't. I was going to buy a van years ago back in Bowling Green and I just couldn't work out the deal. So I begrudgingly thought, okay, if I wasn't going to get the right thing, you know, the church van that I'm going to use for youth ministry and children's ministry, if you won't let me get that van that I can use you for, what do I need? And I went in a completely different direction, bought something else. It was amazing. It was in, it was in Hopkinsville. I had it the next day. The bank suddenly had the loan money for me. Everything worked out, so I bought the wrong thing because the right thing just wouldn't work. Two weeks later, that little customized van place was closed up. The guy was in prison, the whole nine yards. And if I had bought that van, boy, I wanted it so bad. If there were any problems with it, it had been all on my shoulder. The Lord, knows, he looks out for us. He does. God is always trying to talk to his children. Have you ever tried talking to your kids and they wouldn't hear you? Right there in the room, wouldn't hear you? That's what God feels like sometimes. But he's trying his best to let you know you are precious to him. He loves you. And he proved it by shedding his blood and his broken body. God needs you. Not because he has any deficit within himself, but what he's trying to do, he needs, he needs boots on the ground. <laughs> needs boots on the ground. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. You ever sung that song? I'm not nuts. I just did children's ministry for years and years way back when. You're in the Lord's army. He needs your hands, he needs your feet, he needs your mouth, he needs your mind, he needs your heart. And God is going to do things through you that you wouldn't believe he could do. I could barely get out of high school, and here I am. 
In fact, God loves to do things the hard way. He has people doing things they're not particularly good at, like Moses, like my daughter Sarah, the missionary with the speech impediment. God loves to do that the hard way, do, do things the hard way. If you know any preachers that grew up around you and then became preachers, aren't you a little bit amazed God chose them? Doesn't that, doesn't that happen to you? You're punching each other. I don't know who you're thinking of right now, but you're punching each other. God takes these, these ruffians, these scallywags, these whatevers, calls them to preach, and they end up being great pastors. But you're saying, well, I don't see how we got to this point. Well, the greatest pastor in Scottsville where I, when I was there was Danny Patrick, the son of the former famous bootlegger in town. He's got the biggest, strongest church in town, and he's the bishop in his denomination. And people like to remind him of who his daddy was. And he will smile real big and remind them of who his daddy is. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. And if you're not praying for God to call one of our kids into the ministry... Or if you're not praying for those around here who are doing a lot of ministry as they figure out exactly what God is trying to do and why something new is bubbling in them and, 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 and getting into their whole family system. If you're not lifting those people up that they figure that out and go with God, then you're missing an opportunity because those people might go overseas, but they need your prayers right now. God needs you. God needs you. Don't wait for a burning bush. Just be faithful today. When my girls were little, they'd go to sleep at night and I'd be praying for their husbands. Oh, daddy. Oh, daddy. Then one day, Sarah brings home that Cuban guy, good looking fella, Ray Rosales. First words out of my mouth was, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you. Dad, dad, dad. Oh, yeah, we've been praying for you for years. Didn't know what you looked like. We've been praying for you for years. I think we probably need to keep doing that. Never too soon. To start encouraging, lifting up each other. Some of, some of us go on mission trips. Some of us slip money and some pray, 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 pray. They come home and we find out what our prayers did from the other side of the world. Isn't God good? Are you in the ministry? Are you in the ministry? Finally ahead. Yes. You're in the ministry. You're in the ministry. It's all right to be part-time. Just don't forget, you've got a job to do. You're in the ministry. Might not be a preaching ministry. And you might preach me under the table at some point in time. But you're in the ministry. Because Jesus is here.